Hey, leader, and welcome to episode number 344 of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Baritone Advisors. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that you enjoy our content and become a subscriber. Know that you can also watch all of our episodes over on our YouTube channel, so make sure you're subscribed there as well. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while and it's impacted your life, it would mean the world to me if you would leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever app you listen to podcasts through. That really does help us to grow our audience and reach more leaders. So thank you in advance for that. Well, in today's episode, you'll hear my conversation with Lee Kreitcher, and we talk about all things leadership succession. And what I love about what Lee says in this conversation is no matter where you are in your leadership journey, you need to be thinking about succession. And so I think you're really going to be challenged by this. And Lee is no stranger to the podcast. He's been on several times. In fact, he was one of the first interviews back in episode number 38. So if you enjoy this, you can go back and listen to that as well. And if you don't know much about Lee, let me tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Lee Kreitcher is the president of the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation, providing vision and oversight to the mission of the PLF, which brings together leaders for the good of their city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Lee is also the founder of Future Forward Churches and the author of two books, For a New Generation and Seamless Pastoral Transitions, where he talks about the dramatic transformation of the church he pastored from an aging, dying church into a growing, multi-generational church. Lee previously served as Vice President of Leadership Development for Development Dimensions International and as Regional Vice President for Linkage, Inc., He earned his bachelor's degree from Geneva College, a master's degree from Fuller Theological Seminary, an MBA from the University of Pittsburgh, and a doctor of ministry from the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And again, we talk about all things leadership succession, and for the first time ever, I take Lee Kreitcher through the lightning round, and you're going to love that. But before we dive into our conversation, just a few announcements. This episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast is sponsored by Baritung Advisors. The financial advisors at Baritung Advisors help educate and empower clients to make informed financial decisions. You can find out how Baritung Advisors can help you develop a customized financial plan for your financial future by visiting their website at baritungadvisors.com. That's B-E-R-A-T-U-N-G advisors.com. Securities and investment products and services offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA and SIPC, Baritung Advisors, LPL Financial, and L3 Leadership are separate entities. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny, and my wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings at Henny Jewelers and had a wonderful experience. And not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in people. In fact, for every couple that comes in engaged, they give them a book to help prepare for marriage, and we just love that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out Henny Jewelers. And with all that being said, let's dive right in. Here's my conversation with Lee Kreitcher. Lee Kreitcher, it is an honor to have you back on the podcast. I was just sharing with you before we hit record that uh, you were one of the first episodes. You were episode number 38 of the L3 Leadership Podcast. It was almost a decade ago, which is crazy to think about. And uh, (laughs) man, we've developed quite a relationship uh, from that point on. And you're now the president of the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation here in Pittsburgh and doing great things in our city. And so welcome back to the podcast. Uh, Thank you, Doug. It's my pleasure. And uh, we have become great friends. And uh, for those who listen to you regularly, uh, it's great. It was great to see you the other day at Light of Life where your leadership was in action. And so you're not just a student of leadership, but you are a leader and a leader of leaders. And uh, it's great to have seen how God has blessed and used you. And it's great to be with you today. Oh, thanks, Lee. And for those listening, when we initially did the interview, you were the pastor of, uh, I, th- I don't know if it was Amplify at the time. Was it, it may have, was it still Pittsburgh East? I think at that time it was Pittsburgh East Community Church. And then once we added several campuses that were not in the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh, <laughs> we renamed the church Amplify Church. Yeah, so just to catch our listeners up, so Lee founded a church that was originally called Pittsburgh East, and they've since rebranded Amplify. Uh, He also worked for an international uh, leadership development company called DDI, and then uh, for a a period of time, and then he came back and turned around the church, which was probably the focus of some of our earlier episodes. Mm -hmm. But since our last episode, you've handed off the church uh, to your successor, Jason Howard, and uh, the church is thriving. And you've been getting a lot of attention and interest from pastors and leaders of organizations asking you, hey, 
how did you actually have a successful transition? And so it seemed like you got so much attention that you actually wrote a book, which is going to be the topic of what mm-hmm. we talk about today. So you wrote a book called The, the Seamless, Seamless Pastoral Transitions. And if you're listening to this, whether or not you're a pastor, I would, I would say this could also be titled Seamless Leadership Transitions. But yes. that's the focus today. And Lee, just give us an overview. You know, Why did you write this book and, and what are you hoping that leaders get out of it? Well, I think the first book I wrote for New Generation was because I was getting so many questions about how our church was transformed from an aging, dying church to a multi-generational church. And then once I handed the church off to a next generation leader, which was about three and a half years ago, I started to get a lot of questions because there's so many leaders who are approaching that age where they really need to think about it. Really, almost every age you need to think about it. But uh, particularly they're saying, How did you actually uh, mentor and prepare this next generation leader? And how did you hand things off in a way that went so smoothly? And so that's why I wrote this book that I put into it everything I know about the topic. Yeah. Um, So you in it. So I I think I heard the statistic. I don't remember if this was from you or another leader, but at least in the church world, about 10% of successions are actually successful, which is a horrendous stat. And that leaves churches in really, really bad positions. And in the book, you actually talk about six pitfalls uh, to avoid or six pitfalls that, you know, interrupt transition. And, you know, I'd love to go through all of them, but um, the first one, whoop, let me just go back. The first one is just staying too long. And I, can you just talk more about this? You just mentioned, you know, you should pretty much be thinking about transition at every age, which few leaders do. Can you talk more about how to know when to think about it and how do you know if you're staying too long? Well, I think that the uh, most important thing is to recognize our mortality. I recommend even relatively young pastors to work with their board to identify an emergency successor because what happens for, uh, for many churches, there is a really big change in their momentum and their mission when there's an unnecessary gap in time between the outgoing and the incoming pastor. So seamless pastoral transition is all about eliminating that unnecessary gap in time. And so even with an emergency successor that's been approved by the board, if something happens with the, um, with the outgoing pastor that's unexpected, then there is a pastor who can step in at the moment and the congregation does not experience that gap in time. Wow. Do you have, and you did that relatively quickly when you came back. What was the, the time period between when you came back to Amplify and when you actually named Jason? Not just as the, to my understanding, he wasn't just the emergency successor. He was like the successor. Uh, what was that period of time? Yeah, I came, um, I came back into full-time ministry at age 50. And so within, I think, four years, I had na- Jason named as the emergency successor. And he had been with me all four of those years. So I was able to invest what I could in him. And yet the board didn't name him as the permanent successor for a few years after that. Um, But again, so I'm in my early 50s and identifying an emergency successor who, and to no one's surprise, ended up being my permanent successor. Yeah, and do you have any advice for leaders out there looking uh, for an emergency slash successor? What traits did you look for? How did you end up actually knowing Jason was the one? Well, I think, and back a little bit to your earlier question of waiting too long, of the case studies that I wrote about in the book, the average age of the uh, outgoing pastor when they did the formal handoff was approximately 65. Hmm. Uh, So it ranged from early 50s to early 70s, but right around the mid 60s was the average age. That doesn't mean that's right for everybody. But at some point, there is a time where you need to say, is the well-being of the church, especially the ability of the church to reach the next generation, would that be better served by a next generation leader? And to postpone that into your mid 70s, late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, Almost always the church ages out along with the pastor. And so there are many reasons pastors don't, that they do stay too long. But I think if you love your church, you have to really start to pray and think about who could I uh, hand this off to. Now, sharing leadership is a critical issue. If you, I had one pastor who said, um, 
two, there were two different pastors. One, one who said, first of all, there's no one anywhere in our church who has any leadership capacity. And so there's nobody for me to invest in. Well, that's almost like David's father who pulled everybody aside who he thought was worth investing in, except the one that God said <laughs> was worth investing in. And, you know, the unfortunately, we don't have Nathan's around or Samuel's around to point out our David's. But we have to identify there are David's in your midst if you're willing to look. And then sharing leadership is important. Another pastor said, I am called to preach and I will preach every weekend, every Sunday service. I'll go on vacation in between Sundays. I will preach every Sunday till the day I go to be in heaven. Well, you're not sharing leadership and so you'll never have a successor. So just assume that you're going to die and the church will be left holding the bag and they'll have to figure out who that successor will be. Um, Now, there are times that maybe there is no one internally that you really can raise up it doesn't give you a reason to not share leadership, but there are times that maybe that the right person is external to the organization. And there's many ways that you can go about identifying that. But if ideally you can identify someone internally and the church can get to know them and the church can see the kind of relationship you have with them. And then when it comes time to hand things off, it's seamless. That's pretty powerful. And I think the greatest biblical example of any leadership transition is Moses handing off to Joshua, and that's exactly how it happened. Do you have any any thoughts on on timing? So I'm thinking of Jason in your your instance. So he was a young leader. You named him the emergency successor. You know, it was clear the potential was there. And I forget, wasn't it like 14 years from the time he was like named emergency? What was the time period there? Well, I, it was probably about ten years from the time he was okay. named, but he was he was with me on staff for fifteen years before he became the senior pastor. Um, and if he didn't have ants in his pants, he probably would have been uh, there a couple more years. But we we had some uh, great fellowship over when the timing of the transition would take place, and he pretty much said, "Hey." Uh, well, we had some external consultants who came in and said, mm. "You know what? Your church is ready whenever you're ready." Um, and Jason said, I'm ready. And so we <laughs> actually ended up moving it up a couple of years, but there's a little bit of, uh, uh, of intense fellowship over the timing. And you know what? That's the thing. There's nothing easy about leadership transition. The emotions, particularly of the outgoing and the incoming pastor, um, are not easy to deal with. But God calls us to be able, if, if we don't have the maturity as Christian leaders to deal with our emotions, then shame on us. Um, even if it's not easy. And so um, I think, you know, when you talk about things that go wrong, too often uh, handoffs go wrong because of egos. Mm. And it's the big ego of the outgoing pastor, you know, who can't let go, or the big ego of the incoming pastor who can't patiently or respectfully um, wait till the right time. And all of a sudden things come, come apart at the seams when they don't have to. That's so good, Lee. I mean, yeah, that's what I was curious about. You know, you have a young leader that knows, hey, I can take this over. And oftentimes, young leaders want your role anyway, as it is as a young leader. And and oftentimes, they probably think they're ready before they are. So what I'm hearing you say, at least the way it worked with you and Jason was, it was just open conversations that were continual. And it sounds like it was also helpful to bring in a third party. Is that something you'd also recommend for churches? Yeah, and, and we brought in the third party. We had, you know, one of the great books on leadership, Pastoral Transition, is by Vander Blumen and Bird. And we actually reached out to both of, both of them and had input from both of them. And we really weren't asking them to uh, intervene between us or to, to mediate between us. We were just saying, help us to build a strong and healthy plan. And so I think it's great to have some external support and some help. And they were, they did help to prompt uh, us to reconsider the timing of the plan. And uh, that's what caused us to need to really uh, work through uh, some of the specifics. And I've I've seen other case studies where uh, pastors who weren't willing to let go lost an absolutely amazing successor who the church loved. Totally unnecessary just to hang in there a little longer. Um, and I saw times where incoming pastors were too disrespectful and too impatient. 
And they ended up losing the opportunity to be that successor because they started to undermine the outgoing pastor in one way or another and actually ended up like an Absalom in a way. Uh, and that's that's just it. You know, the outgoing pastor can't be a Saul um, who is threatened by the incoming leader and the incoming pastor can't be an Absalom who, you know, who, who has to push the other one out. Yeah. Talk about the, the senior leader. One of your other pitfalls that I love is, is handing off the baton without taking another. And I think, you know, you mentioned ego, but I also think, you know, you had a unique experience in the fact that you led the church, went to a whole different organization, led a different organization and then came back and led. But, um, and then you out, you, you can, I would love for you to share your story of how you got to the Pittsburgh leadership foundation, but I think there would be so much fear on the senior leader thing of, Hey, if, if I don't have this church, if I don't have this organization to lead, who am I? And and what am I going to do? Can you share your story and your advice to leaders thinking like that? Yeah. It's Moses had the advantage over us in that right after he handed off, he died. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, if we're handing off, let's say at age 65, which is when I handed off our church, you're looking at 15, 20, 25 more years of fruitful ministry. God's invested so much in you. And so for the pastor who just says, okay, I'm leaving, but they don't identify the baton that God is handing them, then they will have a very, very, very difficult time letting go because your identity is still as senior pastor of that church. You get so much of your value or self self worth and self, um, uh, you, know, you know, the feelings that you have about your success are so tied up with those people coming up with you after Sundays and saying that message changed my life, and I am so I can't imagine life without you as my pastor. Those things, that, that those are a huge part of our life. So to let go, it's kind of like the you know the person who is a trapeze artist, you have to know that there's some uh, something coming that you're going to grab a hold of before you let go of the other. And so I think it's, whether it's years, uh, certainly a year or two before you hand off, prayerfully discerning. I, I went to a, a life coach who really helped me to mm-hmm. discern what my next season of ministry would be. Out of that, I started Future Forward Churches, which uh, really is a nonprofit that helps churches and church leaders to navigate through uh, church revitalization or leadership transition. But I knew that that would be a place where I could really sink my teeth into something new and serve God without regretting having let things go. Interestingly enough, within, uh, within about six months of when I handed things off to Jason, um, the door opened for me to lead an amazing not-for-profit in Pittsburgh called the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation. We bring leaders together for the common good of our city. And it really has been in the th- almost three years that I've been there has been such a perfect fit, you know, like uh, for exactly who God has wired me to be. And interestingly enough, had I not handed things off a little earlier than I was planning, that opportunity would have opened up when I could not have taken it. And so there's all kinds of things to trust that God has something absolutely amazing and rewarding for you. But you've got to work at identifying what that is and not wait till after you hand things off and deal with all the emotions of loss. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is there is life on the other side of transition and it could be extremely just as fulfilling or as significant. And really you just have to trust God and be open to it and even be willing to, to get help and input into that. Like a life coach, it sounded like was really helpful. And I was going to mention this later, but I do know you do some consulting with churches. And so you mentioned future forward churches. If someone's listening to this and, you know, by the end of the episode, they're saying, well, you know, hey, I'm starting to think through or maybe for the first time I'm thinking through transition. I would love Lee's input on that. How can people connect with you? I think just go to futureforwardchurches.com um, and futureforwardchurches.com has some free resources for navigating uh, leadership transition and navigating um, church revitalization. And I think you'll find some really great things. Carrie Newhoff uh, is on there, some information that you know, a session I did with Jason about this topic and some articles that you may find helpful. And there's also a way to get in touch with me if you just want to talk through what your situation you're in. 
Yeah. And so we talked about your other side that, you know, you found another baton to, to pick up after your succession. But can you talk about landing the plane with the succession once you hand off? One of the pitfalls is <laughs> that I love trying to undo the transition. Um, can you talk about what boundaries you set in place once you handed off the church uh, to ensure that, you know, you don't have to get back involved or why is that a pitfall? I do think that the moment that the official handoff takes place, you need to move on with your life and ministry. If you start to look back, uh, to me, it's like when you return a rental car and you drive over those spikes and the sign says severe damage will occur if you back up. Severe damage will absolutely occur. In every case I've seen, um, one was a, a pastor who felt that he wasn't being honored enough by the incoming pastor. And so after a year or so, there's actually a congregational meeting where the incoming pastor was apologizing to the outgoing pastor for uh, not honoring him sufficiently enough. He was just trying to make peace with the outgoing pastor. And the outgoing pastor uh, ended up saying, no, that apology is not enough. I'm starting a new church down the street. Anybody who here wants to come with me, come. And to me, that person would have said if one of their associate pastors had started a new church down the street with members from their church, they would have said that was the height of unethical behavior. And, but they probably didn't realize that they were doing their, theirs was the height of unethical behavior to start this church after they had publicly handed off the church to their successor. Um, So yeah, going back is unwise. And so to me, my role, uh, is very simple. I am a prayerful cheerleader for my successor. People know not to come and criticize him. And people know I'm not going to criticize him. Um, And we have a fantastic relationship, but it's not because I'm looking over his shoulder and giving him advice every day about what he's supposed to be doing. It's it's his turn to, to lead this amazing church called Amplified Church. So good, Lee. Uh, one of the other pitfalls was <clears throat> failing to address financial realities. Can you can you say more about that when it comes to transition? Well, interestingly enough, um, pastors often, as a lot of people do, they, they fail to plan for their financial security at, at retirement um, to be actually complicated even more. Some pastors actually opt out of Social Security, so they don't even have that modest income to look forward to. Mm-hmm. So you have a pastor in their, in their 60s whose salary is the highest it's ever been. And to provide for their, themselves and their families, um, they're looking, how am I going to do that for the next 15, 20, 20 plus years? And so the way that they do that, if they haven't planned, is that they stay stay much longer than is the for the well-being of the church mm-hmm. with a they would never admit it but a primary reason is to keep that income coming in it's 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 not something god would be pleased with but it's it's a reality and i do think that many boards of churches fail a huge responsibility that in a pastor's late 40s early 50s that either the board or a, a member of the board works with the pastor to make sure that they will be secure uh, financially by the time they're in their mid sixties or so. So the choice to stay is not forced by finances. That is so good. Um, One of the other pitfalls, it goes back to selection uh, is choosing a clone. And you and I both deal with leadership study, leadership, organizational leadership. And it does seem like for different seasons, different organizations need different leaders uh, and the temptation with the pitfall is that we want to choose someone just like us because we think that's what the church needs. Can you talk about why that's a pitfall? And, and you and Jason, I, I know you both, again, not as well as you know each other, but it does appear that you guys are pretty much opposites in a lot of ways <laughs> and, and complement each other very, very well. Was that, was that challenging for you? Talk about you know, choosing a clone and, and finding the right leader. Well, early in Jason's ministry, I was... Uh trying to get him to do the right thing, which is to be me. And so um, I really wanted him to adjust his speaking style, his leadership style in every possible way. Uh, And at some point we just were able to have the discussion that he was saying it's not working. 
And to me, it's it's kind of like when Saul finally said to David, he can go to fight Goliath, but only as long as you wear my armor. <laughs> and it's mm-hmm. like David tried it on. He said, it's not going to work for me, <laughs> King Saul. Uh, and so when you try to force your successor to wear your armor, to be you, it's it's a recipe for failure. And it's it's logical. I, oh, to me, our church rebounded from a hundred some people to almost 2000 people uh, and the average age dropped by almost 20 years. So that was under my leadership. So the church loved me as a leader. So the next person should be as much like me as possible. I mean, (laughs) it's not an illogical thought. And the board was pretty much the same. We need somebody just like you because the board is of course loyal um, to the outgoing pastor. But I do find that particularly in Jason's case, when he we we set him free uh, from trying to be me when he uh, worked uh, to lead our city campus, and that campus grew to several hundred people, very healthy and very much under his style of leadership. And it was proof that God can bless different styles of leadership. Mm. And the most important thing for me was just to have that conviction that he was the right person. And as a result, I let go of that idea of having to form him in my image. And so he's ended up doing quite well. And I do believe, and studies have shown, that different seasons of church life required different styles of leadership. And so I think the new, this season, current season of Amplify Church is much um, more served by a Jason and who God created him to be than it would be by me just hanging in there or trying to force someone to be like me. Yeah, it's been a great joy watching both of you. Just It's been fun watching him thrive and, and his new role and, and to see you and get to see you in action on a consistent basis at the PLF and with future four churches has been a joy. I am curious, you know, you talked about naming an emerging su- a successor, letting people see that early on, um, being together in leadership, just in your, whether in your experience or with working with other churches, have you seen transitions where they just go external and find an external candidate go well in hiring a third party firm? Does that ever go well? Do you have any advice for, you know, is it better to go internal or external? Any, any thoughts there? Yeah, actually one of the case studies in the book, that's a great example of seamless leader tra- leadership transition um, happened actually more than one. Uh, by identifying an external candidate, someone who is not on church staff, someone who is not well-known by the congregation. Uh, And in that situation, then you need, I still think there should be an overlap of time. The shortest one in the, of the case studies I did was approximately six weeks long, where both the outgoing and incoming pastors were both employed by the church. The congregation saw them side by side and the congregation knew without a doubt that their beloved outgoing pastor was blessing this incoming pastor. And that's a, that's very powerful. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be an internal person. Uh, if, if you are sharing leadership internally and raising up leaders, at least you have a, the option for it to be an internal person. But either way, the importance of having some kind of overlap where the outgoing pastor is blessing and commissioning the incoming pastor. I think it's critical for the health of the church. Yeah. And in processing that decision, Hey, do we have someone internally or do we need to like look externally? Is that, is that a senior leader? Uh, is that their decision to make or thought? Should they process that with their leadership team? Is that something they should just process with their board? Any, any thoughts there? I, I think it happens in different ways. And uh, in some churches, they're working with not just their board, but also a bishop or an external authority who needs to be a part of the process. Um, for me, I was pr- I prayerfully considered and watched and saw the growth of Jason. And I just came to believe that this was God's plan for our church. And I presented that to our board and they unanimously approved it. Um, for my good friend and your good friend, Jay Passavent, who's in heaven now, um, when he was preparing for his handoff, he actually raised up a number of or had a number of potential leaders go through um, a leadership assessment that was done by DDI, the company that I worked for at one point. And the results of that leadership assessment helped the board and Jay 
to really identify who among the potential candidates would be the most effective. And they picked Scott Stevens, who was absolutely amazing. And again, he yeah. wasn't, he was not a clone of Jay in any way, but he definitely uh, take, took Northway into their new season. And then about nine or 10 years later, he identified his successor, Dave D'Angelo, who now is taking Northway into its next season. And so that's, uh, I think, Northway Christian community here in Pittsburgh is one of the great, great examples of uh, leaders who hold their leadership with open hands, who raise up other leaders, and then hand things off at the appropriate time, all for the well-being of the church. Lee, this has been so good. And again, we're discussing Lee's book, Seamless Pastoral Transitions. Again, I could also just say leadership transitions, not just pastoral. Really encourage you to get a copy of this book. Again, like Lee said, it doesn't matter what age you're at, you should start thinking about succession. And even if you're not in a senior role, you still need to be thinking about raising up leaders behind you that could take your job. So critical subject. And Lee, I want to move into the lightning round because I don't even think we had a lightning round uh, when I first interviewed you. Before we do, is there anything else you want to share with leaders when it comes to succession? Um, not, not particularly, just that no matter who you are as a leader, uh, obviously you should have, uh, you know, if you're a Timothy, you should have a Paul in your life. If you're a Paul, you should have a Timothy or several Timothys in your life. So a great question to reflect on is, who am I being mentored by and who am I mentoring? Because the answers to those questions say a lot about who you are as a leader and any kind of leadership transition that's coming. And that is for, as you said, more than churches. The principles that I wrote about would apply in a corporate setting, in a nonprofit setting. Um, and yet all my case studies are in churches, so I call it a seamless pastoral transition. But anyone going through leadership transition, the principles that we find through the scriptures and through especially the example of Moses and Joshua are absolutely critical and valuable. Yeah, and, and not to put you on the spot, but uh, you know, we mentioned that you worked at DDI, which worked with corporations all over the world. You know, one of the biggest leadership development companies globally. Uh, are you are you open to working with nonprofits and uh, for profits as well, if, if they're listening to this, or is it just strictly churches with your? Capacity? Yeah, I'm I'm pleased to do so because I've held senior leadership roles in a corporate setting, in uh, church settings, and also now in a non for profit setting. So I can relate pretty clearly with almost any leader in the situation that they're in. Um, but I find that so many of these leadership principles are universal. So. Yeah. So we'll include links to all the ways to connect with Lee. If you're interested in that, we encourage you to take advantage of that and that'll all be in the show notes. So with that said, just a few lightning round questions for you, Lee. Let's have some fun. Uh, the Your first trademark one is, lightning round question. <laughs> my trademark. Yeah, they've shifted a little bit, but uh, but a few. But what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Well, I think the best advice I think of is make every choice with your legacy in mind. Make every choice you make with your legacy in mind. And I heard that from Andy Stanley when we were a part of his church when we lived in Atlanta and I was still um, uh, in, in the corporate world. I've never heard that before. That is so good. Um, it may be the same thing, but if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? It would say, make every choice in life with your legacy in mind. But underneath it would say Lee Kreitcher because I've adopted it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you full credit for that if I post it. Um, you've, uh, you're clearly a student of leadership. You've probably read a billion leadership books in your lifetime. Are there are one or two books that have really impacted you either recently or all time in the leadership space that you'd recommend? I think one book, uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins, just had a very profound effect on me as a leader. At the time I read it, I was a corporate leader. But then I carried it into the church. And I've carried it with me in the nonprofit world. And I really believe that that whole principle that we shouldn't settle for good. And I think the only way we can really do that is by not trying to be great at a hundred things, but by paring down the number of things that we focus on. But with the right number of things we're focusing on, we can do great things. Is there anything about your journey that, that people may not know that you think they should know? 
By the way, one other book that oh, yeah. comes to mind is Necessary Endings by Henry Cloud, Dr. Henry Cloud, and especially for outgoing leaders to really do, deal with the emotions of letting go. Fantastic book, Necessary Endings. Yeah, I'll second that. I mean, for both of those, but Necessary Endings was a game changer for me uh, as well. So, um, yeah, what do you wish people knew about Lee Kreitzer that they may not know? Well, probably that even though I've made some very bold and risky decisions in my life, um, even though I always did them believing it was God's will, I never could say God told me. I never was 100% sure. Hmm. And if you wait to your 100% sure that God is telling you to do something, you'll probably be paralyzed and do very little in life. Um, so I always have acted believing that I was doing the right thing uh, in the in major career moves. Um, but then trusting that if I did the wrong thing, thinking I was doing God's will, he would somehow bail me out. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll add something too, just because <clears throat> I doubt this was shared the first time because I didn't know you as well. But one of my favorite facts about Lee that you should know is when Lee got, was invited back to, to turn around his church because it was, it was struggling at the time, uh, you came back after much prayer and you actually did a sermon. What was the, the sermon entitled? Well, the sermon right before the congregational vote was 10 reasons you should vote no for me as your incoming pastor. And <laughs> it was, that was during David Letterman's time. And so it was a top, it was a David Letterman list and 10 reasons to vote no. Uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody was really clear that I wasn't coming back as the pastor I was in the 80s. And I wasn't coming back to keep things going the way they were. The church had one foot in the grave. We had to do some dramatic things. And so, um, it, it it was a a truly monumental sermon, and then ninety three percent, I think, of the people voted yes. It's amazing, uh, but at least they knew what they were getting into. So, hey, if any of you are looking for jobs or interviewing, that could be a great way <laughs> to pitch people in your interview. I love that. Let, let me just say, I still had my corporate job at the time, and if they had voted no. <laughs> Um, I was very happy to return to that job. So I, I may not give that advice if you, <laughs> depending on your circumstances. That's beautiful. Uh, in, in this season of your leadership journey, is there anything keeping you up at night that challenges you? I really sleep pretty peacefully these days, but I do. I, my passion is to make an impact. And I do want to make sure that to whatever God has invested in me, I'm still making an impact from now till the rest of my life. I was on the phone today with Reed Carpenter, who founded Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation, who founded the Amen to Action um, movement, you know, that is feeding thousands and thousands of people. And he's still going strong in his mid 80s, influencing people in a positive way for Christ. And I want to be the same way. Yeah. You mentioned that you sleep good at night. I don't, this just came to mind when you said that. <clears throat> at least in my experience, observing your leadership, you pretty much always remain calm under pressure. I don't know if you're calm internally, um, but any advice, I think a lot of times, especially young leaders that are listening to this, we put, and this happened to me and led to a mental breakdown, was the amount of pressure that we put on ourselves, especially when we're facing stressful situations. We don't sleep well at night where, you know, all the mental health issue leaders are facing now, anxiety, you know, in all of your experience now, you've been leading for decades now. Uh, any advice for leaders on how to, to deal with stress and, and to be able to sleep well at night? Well, I think as a young leader, I, I was up all the time um, <laughs> because I thought it was all on my shoulders. And, uh, of course, it is on your shoulders to some degree, but it's really on your shoulders to do the very best you can do in your current circumstances. And once you do that, at some point I learned to say, God – I have to put the outcome of this into your hands. Um, I can't, you didn't build me to carry this mm -hmm. as a weight, as if everything depends on me making every right decision and um, making every right choice uh, because it's just, it's just not the way life is. And I think I used to think of God's will as being the kind of thing where if you make the wrong turn, you're off course for the rest of your life. Um, uh, but I think of it much more now like a GPS where you turn the GPS on and it never says, why the heck are you there? <laughs> it just That's takes funny. you from exactly where you are. 
wow. and take, takes you to where you're supposed to be. And I think every day, every month, every season, we are turning on the GPS and saying, God, you know where I am now, but where do you want me to go? Yeah, you talked about getting off track. I don't often get to ask this question in interviews, but do you have a favorite failure or something that you went terribly wrong that either you learned a, a, you know, an invaluable lesson from or that turned into a success in the end? Uh, yes. In my late 20s and early 30s, our church had grown from a Bible study to about a thousand people. And I did take it all on my shoulders, a building project, the staffing, everything else. And I thought it was all on me. And I did it to the detriment of any real focus on my marriage and my family. And I ended up leaving the ministry the first time at that time because my marriage fell apart. And so um, this idea that somehow you know, my leadership requires me to steal the time from my marriage and my family if I'm going to be a great leader uh, was, a, was, was false. And both things can be true. Um, fortunately we're heading next year into our 48th anniversary. And so, um, we've been able to recover from that season and God opened the door for me to go to DDI where I became their vice president of leadership development and learned leadership in a way that has benefited me the rest of my life. So even after failure, God's not done with you. Absolutely. Mm. God is not done with you, but uh, if you can avoid it, <laughs> especially uh, the trauma that comes to it with marriage or family trials and failure, then it's best to focus on that and don't leave it on the side and hope it all works out. Wow. That's so good. Lee, you get to spend time with a lot of leaders. <laughs> I, I joke with everyone that, you know, once you transition from the church and we're taking over the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation, I think you met with every significant leader in the city of Pittsburgh in like a, a three-week span. I was super impressed with your networking skills, but uh, you get to spend time with a lot of leaders. I'm just curious, is there a go-to question or two that you always ask when you get to spend time with someone that you look up to and admire in leadership? <clears throat> I, I pretty much will ask um, if it's, if it's someone who I would look to as a mentor, I just ask them, you know, how do you see yourself leaving the kind of impact that God wants you to leave? If I'm talking to a leader who's uh, looking to me as a mentor, I'll pretty much be asking them, who are you mentoring? Who are you bringing alongside of you? Um, because there should be one or two or three people who every meeting you go to, you take them along. Every conference you go to, you take them along. You know, you go out to dinner, you take them along. That you're investing, and in, and in they're um, shadowing you in many ways. And that, to a great degree, how your legacy will live on beyond you. So good. I'm looking forward to this this next question. It's a favorite, but I want to hear your answer. What's your biggest leadership pet peeve? Um. <clears throat> I think my biggest leadership pet peeve is when people who call themselves leaders take on the role of critics instead of take on the role of learners. Mm. And everybody needs to decide at some point in your, in your leadership, are you going to be a critic or are you going to be a learner? Because you will not be both. And um, so to me, when I see someone who has decided they're going to be a critic, I feel bad for them, for the people they lead and for any future that they really have um, and what they're going to leave behind. It's way too easy to descend into that role of critic. Um, but even the people who I would naturally tend to criticize, I say, God, what can I learn from that person? And when you're in a learning mode instead of a critic mode, the, the sky is the limit. Now, I don't know if you have a bucket list or not, but I do know you enjoy great experiences. And uh, I'm just curious. I've been asking people, it, what's something that you've done in your lifetime? It could be anything that you think everyone should experience before they die. Well, we, we love travel. And so we just find that the travel we've done, we've, I think gone to, I know Linda has, I think both of us have gone to all 50 States and visited. Wow. Um, we've been to every continent except South America and Antarctica, which is that's on our bucket list. But I do think that God's creation screams about his majesty and his reality. And as you travel around the world and meet all kinds of people, and whether we've been in the Alps and I've been uh, diving on the Great Barrier Reef and 
it's wow. like, wow, God's creation is so amazing. And then when we think about our temporal and how temporal life is, it is absolutely impossible that heaven would be more boring than earth. Hmm. And so I can't even imagine what heaven will be like when I've seen what I've been blessed to see here in God's creation. And if you could go back and have coffee with yourself at any age, <laughs> what age would that be? And what would you tell that version of Lee if you would have actually listened that could have made a difference? Yeah, I probably, that would have been my late twenties. And I would have said what I was saying earlier, yeah. paying attention to your family life is as important as, as your success in ministry. And I probably would have said, Oh, thank you very much. And then ignored it. But nevertheless, that, that's what I would have tried to, to shake my younger self to um, avoid hurting others. And I'm, I'm sure I asked this in my first interview with you, because this was one of the original questions, but you talked about make every decision with your legacy in mind. I'm just curious, as you've shifted into an, another season of leadership in your life, what do you want your legacy to be at this point? I think it pretty much is that I led well and that I um, elevated countless other leaders to lead well. Anything else you want to leave leaders with today? No. May God be with you. It's he and he and just know that he is. Thank you so much, Lee. This was fantastic. I hope everyone goes out and buys a copy of your book. And I hope the people will reach out to you uh, to get some consulting because we all need to take transition seriously. So thanks again. And hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Thank you, Doug. God bless. Well, hey, Leader, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Lee. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can find ways to connect with him and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash 344. And Leader, as always, the new year is coming up, and I want to challenge you that if you want to 10x your growth in 2023, then you need to either launch or join an L3 Leadership Mastermind Group. Mastermind groups have been the greatest source of growth in my life over the last seven years. And if you don't know what they are, they're just simply groups of six to 12 leaders that meet together on a consistent basis for at least one year in order to help each other grow, hold each other accountable, and to do life together. If you're interested in learning more, go to l3leadership.org forward slash masterminds. And as always, I like to end every episode with a quote. And I'll quote Dan Sullivan, who said this recently. He said, you should never expect any opportunity to be given to you unless you give value to other people. And that's what we're all about here at L3 Leadership is adding value to people. Well, hey, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Know that Laura and I love you. We believe in you. And we say it every episode, keep leading. Don't quit. The world desperately needs your leadership. We'll see you next episode.